Hello friends, now before anything else, I just want to recommend to you to watch my last episode where I visited my hometown. Maybe you saw it in your subscription feed and thought that that was just some kind of boring filler video, but it really wasn't. It's actually one of my most passionate pieces of work yet. And even though not too many of my subscribers have watched it yet, those who have watched it have really liked it and I have gotten an overwhelming amount of positive feedback. So please give it a chance and check it out. You can find a link to it in the video description and I will also post it in the comment section. But let's get on to this episode. What are we going to do now? Well, about two weeks ago, I've been trying to get all these old printers here running again. And I tried that using Ubuntu. Now this time I will refurbish an old computer try to get Windows XP running on it and then I will try to get the old printers running on this machine and then in the end I will also try Windows 10 but before I even got the idea of using an old computer to get these printers running again I did something very straightforward I went on Google and I just typed in HP printers drivers or something similar and I just wanted to know if the manufacturers of these old printers still offer some kind of support for nearly 20 year old models. So what I found is that for example here for the HP LaserJet 4000N the newest actual driver on their website was from 2003 and it was for Windows XP 32 bits. For the LaserJet 3100 I didn't even find a driver not even for Windows NT or something old fashioned like that. But what I found was that firmware and installer package that I thought I needed back in the last video. But the latest version of that from 1999 was designed for Windows 2000. And for the DeskJet 1100C I only found drivers designated for Windows 95 and Windows NT dated October 27th 1998. And in the next step I tried the same thing with Canon printers and I tried to find something for my BJC 5500. Didn't find anything and that's why I tried different type numbers like BJC 5000 or 4400. But for my actual model I couldn't find anything, nothing, not even for the really old operating systems. And last but not least I tried it with Brother drivers and for my Brother HL 5150D I found yet another driver from 2003 for Windows XP 32 bits. So in short all three manufacturers have an online database where you can find software drivers, firmware and so on for even very old models. But they didn't really bother to check if their old drivers also work with more recent operating systems. And I'm just guessing here but it might have to do with the fact that they have an interest in selling new printers rather than keeping old ones running. And later in the video I will try to use these old drivers with Windows 10 and we'll see how that works. But first I really wanted to build up an old PC again and just recreate the environment of back then. I just thought it was a cool idea and might be useful for things like this in the future as well. So I went online and I bought this old PC here for 5 bucks on eBay. So let's open it up first and take a look inside. So as you can see for yourself it's incredibly dirty in here. It's this weird amalgamation of dust hair, humidity and maybe cigarette smoke, you know what I'm talking about. So we'll have to take this apart completely, clean all the different components. Then while doing that we can check how old this thing actually is, what kind of components were used, see what has maybe to be repaired and then we'll put it all back together. So inside the enclosure I found this date code here from 2004. It's a little late for my taste in this case, but still well in the era of Windows XP. So before really taking anything apart, I turned on the compressor and before touching anything else here, I blew out most of the really thick dust from inside. And what I'm doing here is using a screwdriver or something like that in order to hold the fans in place. Because if you use pressured air to remove the dust inside, that can cause these fan blades to spin very quickly. Relatively high voltages are then induced in the stator windings of these brushless DC motors. And that could potentially harm the driver circuits inside or other electronics that are connected to these fans. 
So a lot of the parts are still dirty, but I have to take them out individually now. The first thing that I take out is the old graphics card. And well, this is a GeForce FX 5900. And back in the day, this would have been a top-notch high-end graphics card. Today, it's basically worthless. Next, I remove the two 512 MB RAM modules. And here we can see a first actual fault of this computer. Can you see how bulged the tops of these old capacitors are? And if you take a closer look, maybe you can even see that there is a brownish substance coming out of the vents of some of them. Well, that shows us that these capacitors are faulty and we will have to replace them. And after having seen this, I'm curious to see what the capacitors inside the power supply look like. And we have to take it out anyway to clean it from the inside because I suspect that there's a lot of dust in there. And ah, look at that. So again, the blowgun. And well, here we have the secondary side filters of this uh, ATX power supply, the very output side. And these are the electrolytic capacitors that are typically, well, prone to be faulty and overheat after a while and get bulgy. But other than the ones near the CPU, these ones actually look good. So in the next steps, I simply continue to disassemble this computer. And when you do that yourself, there are not so many things that are super important here. Like for example, the internal loudspeaker, the reset button, or maybe the front USB port cables or something. But one thing that is important is that you know where the power switch must be connected. And that's why you should download the manual of your motherboard before taking it completely apart or at least take a photograph of how the little cables are connected to those pins on the motherboard. And with all the wires removed from the board, I can then start to unscrew it and take out the motherboard so that we can then take care of those capacitors next. But first, so much dirt, so much dirt. It hurts my German soul. Ah, oh, it's so hard to get computers clean again. Ah, oh, well, has to suffice for now, I guess. So I take off the heatsink and this fan so that I can better access the capacitors. And maybe I should also remove the CPU here before trying to desolder these capacitors. But I didn't do it at the end of the day. This only cost me five bucks. So in the next step, what I do is that I reheat the solder on the old capacitors. And well, I try to use a desoldering pump, but it's really hard. These multi-layer boards here are really not that easy to work on. But by reheating the solder and then levering off the capacitors, I managed to take them out. And I directly ordered replacement parts. You can find those on Amazon, for example. A link is in the video description. And they have arrived after just one day. So I put in the new ones and I solder them in place. And since electrolytic capacitors are polarized components, you have to solder the capacitors in with the right polarization. And here again, best just take a picture of the motherboard before starting to remove the old capacitors so that you know how the capacitors were polarized in the first place. But before going on, let's take a brief look at those faulty capacitors and take some measurements. And for that, let's first measure the capacitance of the old capacitors and compare the values of those that were bulged and opened and those that still looked normal. Here you can see that the first capacitor, bulged and opened, has way less capacitance than rated, only 1400 and of rated 3300 microfarads. The next one, still looking normal, has way more than 3300 microfarads. And then again, one of the bulged ones, well, 1300 end of 3300 microfarads, while again, the others that still look normal have even more than rated. And now let's measure the ESR of these capacitors. That's even more telling in most cases than the capacitance. And you can see that the ones that still look good have a fraction of an ohm. In this case, values between 0.2 and 0.7 ohms while the bulge ones have values way over two ohms. And that is way too much. It should only be a fraction of one ohm, if at all. The brand new replacement caps show ESR values even way lower than the good looking old ones. 
With that being taken care of, I next cleaned the CPU and CPU heatsink and renewed the thermal compound. Then I should also have replaced the battery on the motherboard, but I didn't have one at hand, so I left the old one in place. And then I reassembled the entire computer. Not perfectly, but good enough to test the printers. In the next step I then ordered an old version of Windows 2000 and I tried to install it on the computer. However the installation process always stopped and freezed or I got an ugly blue screen. And it took me a long while to find out that the reason was that one of the RAM modules was also faulty. So I replaced the RAM and by the way thanks to all the guys who sent me RAM and graphics cards and whatnot. I owe you a lot, you helped me out a lot already. But there was another mishap while trying to troubleshoot what the problem was with the installation. I tried to clean the Windows 2000 installation CD and broke it. Ugh. So I decided to skip 2000 and install WinXP, which is much easier to get. So once I got Windows XP running, it was really easy. Four of the six printers, the LaserJet 4000N, 4050N, the HP DeskJet 1100D and the brother HL5150D were just installed as plug and play printers. You didn't even have to choose a printer from a list and they worked right away with Windows XP. Even the rather exotic Canon BJC 5500 could be installed without the need for an external driver. You had to pick it from a list within uh, the installation process on Windows XP, but it worked like a charm. And while I had problems with the Ubuntu driver, this time it really worked without any problems. So the last printer that really made problems was the HP LaserJet 3100. Okay, so we're pulling out the power cord and then I will press stop clear, stop löschen while you now reconnecting the power cord on the back side. Okay. And there it reads boot ROM 101097 ready for download. And I had thought that I could just update the firmware and that it would work again. So I started that firmware installer on Windows XP and it ran, but it just didn't work. There was no firmware installed on the LaserJet 3100. I don't know what's the matter and I think I never will. But in the end, I also tried to connect my printers to Windows 10. And that was actually quite the surprise because I was able to install most of the printers with the Windows XP 32-bit drivers. You know, I had downloaded them from the pages before and on the pages it always said this is a driver for Windows XP 32 bits or for Windows NT or whatever. But almost all of those really old drivers worked on Windows 10 32 bits just as fine. And one really big surprise was that the a printer that I regarded as very exotic, the BJC5500, believe it or not, it was automatically installed as a plug and play printer on Windows 10 32 bits without even the need for the XP drivers. But it was completely different on Windows 10 64 bits where I got none of the printers running, not with the old drivers or with any other drivers that were available to the operating system. So if you know a trick how you can use those 32 bit drivers on Windows 10 64 bit, then let me know it in the comment section because my conclusion so far is Ubuntu worked wonderful, but with the Canon printer, the colors were wrong. Windows XP is maybe the best solution if you have an old computer and you can ins install Windows XP. Uh, that was really the easiest way to operate the old printers. Windows 10 32 bits also work great with the old drivers, 
but for me right now Windows 10 64 bit is the end of the line for these 20 year old printers. So that is it with me and these printers and for now with getting things running and repairing that's all that it has been on my channel for the last couple of weeks but that was just because I moved into the new shop and there were so many things to take care of so many old things to get rid of or to repair but that's over now we're going to focus on maker projects again and the next few videos and probably for the future will be about electric motors electric motor control and some very interesting maker projects revolving around that issue. So if you have been a little bored about what the channel has been about recently, it's going to change. And if you want to help me out, maybe kick in a buck and visit patreon.com slash TPAI. And as always, I hope you liked this and to see you soon.